All right, this is part 15 of my series examining Russ Miller's uh, 50 Facts versus Darwinism in the Textbooks. Um, I We were discussing uh, evolution of birds briefly when I ended, and I'm going to return to his uh, Swinton quote. There is no fossil evidence of the remarkable change from reptile to bird. There is no evidence of this taking place. And to restate there, Russ, uh, you are trying to convince the audience that a quote about the evolution of birds from 50 years ago, 50 years ago, is relevant to the current knowledge of, of dinosaur and bird evolution, um, which I would hope your audience would take the time to look up just in the last 20 years, just in the last 10 years, um, the enormous leaps forward we've come in finding fossil dinosaurs, um, transitional dinosaurs to birds. Fantastic fossil series. Um, amazing. Indisputable if you've got a fucking brain cell functioning. But furthermore, Dingleberry, the, um, that Swinton quote is from a chapter of a book. Um, the chapter written by Swinton is called On the Origin of Birds, and he discusses the actual fossil evidence. Um, that's known at the time, which consisted of Archaeopteryx, and states that while it's assumed that there was a theropod ancestor of Archaeopteryx, there's no known fossil um, intermediates between a typical theropod and that. But then he goes on and talks about multiple characteristics within the theropods, specifically the Manoreptorans, um, that suggest there may be a bird linkage. He ended up being correct about that when good fossils started coming in soon afterwards, really. Um, so, it, it, your, the point, your point is, is, is meaningless. And after that, he also discusses from Archaeopteryx uh, things like what we now call the Pigostelia, I believe, the, um, the, the birds with a pigostyle, uh, which, which he, dis I mean, he discusses all the radiation of birds after Archaeopteryx, uh, before the Cenozoic, and the origin of the modern type bird. Um, so to take that quote, from that chapter, ignoring the rest of the chapter, which, by the way, I know you're taking that quote from somebody else. You didn't actually read that book, okay? You don't, you don't, you're not, you know, you didn't study that book to find that quote and then take it in context and try to make some point. No, you saw that quote and it goes, oh, here's an evolutionist that says that birds never evolved from reptiles. And, and, and you're putting it out there for your ignorant audience uh, to marvel over. Yeah, here's a modern textbook showing... All sorts of critters and reptiles connected together with a solid red line going from the reptiles to Archaeopteryx. And they've got this dotted line going up to modern birds. So my question to you is if a solid red line is based on no evidence, what does the dotted line represent? <laughs> Mind-boggling. The reason there's a solid red line between Archaeopteryx and the theropod dinosaurs, not reptiles, by the way. The, the term reptile is a really poor term. Uh, I know you're using it because it conjures up some, you know, dumpy lizard and then a modern bird. To, the, you, you widen the gap in your audience's mind and make it seem more ridiculous, um, ignoring the fact that theropod dinosaurs were extremely bird-like. Um, but that's an aside. Um, the reason that there's a solid red line between Archaeopteryx and the theropods is because since since... Fifty years ago, when Swinton made that quote, the gap has been filled in extensively. Dozens and dozens and dozens of species. Subfamilies have been erected that fill that gap now, meaning we have multiple species, multiple genera that fall into that category, um, sometimes so smoothly, many times so smoothly, that there's the, the, the current debate is whether or not this should be called a bird or whether or not it should be called a theropod dinosaur. Yet this modern uh, biology high school book tells the kids one thing is certain. Birds evolve from ancient reptiles. This is the reason we're losing so many Christian kids. They're being taught this is fact, and they're not seeing what a fraud it is. It only takes a couple of minutes for me to reveal this information to people. We just need the opportunity to do so. Actually, Russ, for once I agree with you completely. Um, I think you've hit on an excellent point here. It only takes a few minutes for you to spout outright lies and bullshit to a group of scientifically illiterate people. While it takes hours, it takes hard work, it takes study to present this information 
and I'm not talking about what I'm doing here. This is this is for a YouTube audience. I'm talking about to a grade school, to a high school, to a college classroom. It takes dedication on the teacher's part. It takes dedication on the student's part. It takes hard work on everybody's side to present this material in a way that is truthful, that is honest, that is understandable, that follows and makes sense. Okay? Um, and that's the problem. Okay? Yeah. I can present... I can go into a classroom and I can present an hour's worth showing all of the data currently known on the transition between name your species and name your other uh, related form. Um, and somebody could come along and go, um, you know, God did it. And, you know, it's simple. What he just said is stupid, you know, whatever. And everybody laughs. And my point is, is undone. No matter how much evidence, no matter how much actual work I did. And this goes back to, you fuckwit, um, that Lewontin quote way back when you, the one you butchered about, um, you know, the presentation of scientific information and, and we can't let a divine foot in the door. Um, that's what that quote, again, was about. Your side is easy to present. It's really, really simple. You don't have to understand science. You don't have to understand biology. You don't have to understand anything. Okay. Your answer comes down to, uh, you know, look it, that's a bird. Look it, that's a reptile. God made them wonderfully. And that's as far as anybody needs to know about the issue. Now, once every couple of years, it seems, they come out with front page headlines of the missing link found between reptile and bird. I don't know why they've hung their hat on having to find this one link. Keep in mind, if we went from bacteria to everything on Earth, they should have trillions of missing links. So since they don't find any, what are the odds of them finding the one they want without finding hundreds of millions of others first? And really, it doesn't make any sense, does it? I'm not sure where you get this idea that evolutionists, as if we're all one gigantic body, paleontologists and cosmologists and biologists and invertebrate zoologists like myself, are all collectively we're all looking for this dino bird transition we just have to have that one we've hung our hat on it if we don't find it evolution will crumble if that's bullshit okay what you're talking about is you're talking about there's a few points in evolution that sell newspapers that sell magazines the popular science press popular media and that people are excited people love dinosaurs um and people, well, they like birds. Um, and so these, 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 these bird dinosaurs make, you know, beautiful illustrations, beautiful, you know, the, the feathered raptor leaping upon its prey. That kind of stuff is exciting. It captures the public imagination and it makes people buy the magazine. Um, it's not that that's the only thing that the evolutionary community has discovered that year. If you look at actual science magazines... You'll see there's not an issue that goes by in any of the major uh, taxonomic magazines, at least, where they don't have some new discovery about the evolution of some form, about uh, either a fossil form that's, that's new, a group that's new, some new step that wasn't known before. It's happening constantly. They get overshadowed by human fossils, and they often get overshadowed by dinosaur fossils. But that doesn't mean that the work isn't going on. Um, and to say that, again, is you're appealing to the ignorance of your audience and maybe to your own ignorance. But this, they, they had announced this missing link, and then this came out in USA Today a couple months later. The missing link that wasn't, this true missing link between dinosaurs and birds, sprouted its tail not 120 million years ago, but <clears throat> just before being smuggled out of China. Nice use of the word they, you divisive little shit. Um, who's they? The evolutionist conspiracy against you and your 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 flock, whatever. Um, it's really ridiculous. So uh, Archaeoraptor, good, nice one to bring up there. Uh, uh, so Archaeoraptor was indeed a legitimate fraud. It that's right, but it wasn't a fraud by scientists against scientists to fool the public into accepting evolution, which I think is what you want people to think. Um, it was a fraud done by the, the famous Chinese fossil manufacturers, those who they take good fossils and repair them, and they take other fossils and they make fake ones because the fossil smuggling business is a huge industry. Um, so they 
created this fraud not to fool people into believing in evolution, but to make a whole shitload of money, and they sold it to a collector illegally. The collector bought it illegally. Um, then the National Geographic heard of it and, and sent legitimate scientists to study it, um, and who didn't know it was a fraud. Now they missed they missed that it was a fraud uh, for whatever reason. You can you can speculate all you want. Um, however, when those scientists who studied it attempted to publish the results, guess what? They were rejected. No scientific publication would pick up the story. Now, National Geographic, in the meantime, had run with it and did a full big spread on it, uh, which is egg on their face. Because it had not passed scientific scrutiny, it never passed scientific scrutiny. Um, with the exception of, I believe, the two scientists that initially studied it, um, most people thought they didn't think it was a fraud necessarily. They thought it was a, they'd mistakenly put more than one thing together. Um, because, guess what? It, based on just the description alone, there were a number of anomalous features. There were a number of things about it that sounded like they came from at least two different things. As it turns out, there's three different species put together for, for Archaeoraptor. But the irony of bringing that up, the irony that you brought that up, because that's good science at work, first of all. I'm good, you know, it, it never entered the scientific literature. It was never heralded by evolutionists as the missing link. Um, maybe the popular press said that, but they're generally wrong anyhow. Um, but the, the irony, the ironic thing about it is, is that the portion of the skeleton that formed the, the long feathered tail uh, was, just, was found to be from another species called Microraptor. Okay, um, now Microraptor is an amazing find. Microraptor was the most significant thing that came out of the Archaeoraptor thing because Microraptor was discovered to have had beautiful feathers. Well, we don't know about color, but beautifully, you know, modern style feathers covering its body, covering its tail, covering its arms, and covering its legs. Um, we have more Microraptor skeletons, including those with full feather now um, than any other of the dromaeosaur dinosaurs. I think there's 33 complete skeletons plus numerous partial skeletons, right? So what was Microraptor? Well, Microraptor was a typical dromaeosaurid like Velociraptor, um, Deinonychus, Uteraptor, all of the, that whole group of dinosaurs, the Manoraptorans, but that specific dromaeosaurid clade of the, of the Manoraptorans. Um, but it was covered with feathers and had long flight-like feathers on its arms and on its legs that when constructed in, in sort of in a living manner, you know, how they would have been attached when it was alive, which we can deduce from the skeletons because they're very well preserved, um, it was discovered that while it couldn't fly, it was by no means a bird. Um, it was a perfectly good reptile by your definition. It was a hell of a glider. Um, it had this, it had that mythological half wing that you creationists are always crowing about no pun intended um and it was a beautiful it could glide like a flying squirrel using these these arms and legs um but it's been stated that if there were no feathers found with it if we had only which we had before only the skeleton of it nobody would have guessed it had feathers nobody would have guessed it was anything other than a small version of a typical theropod dinosaur at all it was just a small theropod dinosaur like Compsognathus or any of the other. I mean, it was completely normal, normal like them until it was found with these feathers on it, until it was found to be fully feathered. Again, illustrating the point that feathered dinosaurs are now known to be abundant. I believe the last count I saw from, and this is a little bit out of date even, there's a book called Glorified Dinosaurs, and I think there's 27 known species of theropod dinosaur that were known to be feathered. It had children believing in feathered dinosaurs that never existed, prominent scientists calling each other names, and two respected science publications under assault. As I stated before, the existence of feathered dinosaurs were not dependent upon Archaeoraptor being a legitimate fossil. In fact, elements of Archaeoraptor were from real feathered dinosaurs. So you're lying through your ass. Why are they so easily fooled? It's because they're so desperate for anything that they can use as proof for Darwinism. Substitute creationism for Darwinism and you'd be 100% correct, Russ.